Today I will summarize various things we have discussed and expand on them in order to create a foundation for further key thoughts that we will engage with over the next few weeks. There are two forms of consciousness familiar to all, dream consciousness and ordinary waking consciousness. In spiritual scientific research, a third form is added, which we call clairvoyant consciousness. We regard dream consciousness really only as a kind of interruption of our continuity of ordinary awareness. And this is because we do not remember our dreams very much. In fact, we do dream continually while asleep. The content of our dream life that we are aware of only makes up a part of our total dream experiences, the ones we recall when awake. Spiritual science therefore teaches that we possess three levels, or also three modes of consciousness, dream consciousness, ordinary waking consciousness, and clairvoyant consciousness, which gains access to the supersensible world. Now you will find it quite easy, starting from clairvoyant consciousness and working your way downward, to gain insight into the relationship between each form of consciousness and the next. Dream consciousness gives us images. We know that our dream experiences are in images and that they cannot easily be integrated into the causal sequence of our daily life. If you were to mingle dream life and waking life, you would become a fantasist. Thus, in our dream experiences, we have images that are at odds with what we call daily reality. If we now consider the relationship between ordinary waking experiences and the content of clairvoyant consciousness, we find something very similar. You see, what clairvoyant consciousness experiences as spiritual, supersensible reality leads it to regard the experiences of our waking life as image. I'm going to read that again. You see, what clairvoyant consciousness experiences as spiritual, supersensible reality leads it to regard the experiences of our waking life as image. In an awakened, illumined state in clairvoyant consciousness, we can say that we experience true reality, and that in contrast to this, what we otherwise call reality is only a sum of images. Expressing this in an abstract way, as here, has little value. It is true that many are quite content to express these things theoretically and think that this in itself will solve great riddles of the world, but it won't. Such things only have value if we engage very practically and specifically with them, though this is only possible in particular areas. One such area, the human being himself, has been the repeated subject of our reflections, and must be so if we are to make progress in the science of the spirit. The human being is a field of study very close to us, of course, and yet often so far removed. Although people are unaware of the supersensible aspects of the human being, they believe that they know about our physical nature. But this too is true only to a limited extent. Ordinary anatomy and physiology are fields of study fraught with countless illusions. Today, if only apparently, we will start from the outward form of the human being, highlighting this threefold nature as I have often described it. If we study the human being in relation to the supersensible world, but as image rather than reality, in terms of mainstream anatomy and physiology, we find that his outward physical form can be divided into three very different parts, the head system, the aspect chiefly concentrated in the head, the trunk, and the extremities, or limbs. In respect of the latter, though, we have to see that this third part of us does not consist only of arms and legs, but also that these limbs have an inward continuation. Let us consider these three systems first of all, which together compose the whole human being. In fact, we ignore supersensible reality 
in a way if we only consider these separate systems as three parts of a whole, for actually each is very distinct and separate. The diverse powers, or let us say currents of energy that share in forming their different shapes, come from very different directions. If we study the human form with powers of supersensible perception, the powers forming the head have to be seen as originating before birth or conception. To study the head, we have to delve backward into the world of spirit rather than into the stream of physical inheritance. The way in which the human head is formed, though here I am speaking of its subtler structures, originates primarily in all the powers imbuing the human soul in the world of spirit before this soul has united at birth or conception with the physical stream of inheritance. The head is chiefly formed not so much by a person's experiences in a past life, nor his outward form then, but by actions he has done, his deeds, and to some extent also his feelings. When supersensible knowledge develops to the point where we gain insight into a form such as a particular person's head, we can start to look back from this to his last incarnation. We touch here on extremely significant secrets of human development. Far more than is apparent to initiates of a less advanced kind, the form of the human head is is connected with a person's karma and the way this develops from a previous incarnation. We will bypass the trunk system for now and consider our extremities, albeit with their continuation inward. By no means are these extremities shaped in as individually specific a way as the human head. Each of us has a distinctive head because the latter points back to former lives on earth. The organization of our extremities, on the other hand, with which the sexual organs are also directly connected, points us forward to subsequent lives on earth. As yet everything in this system is undifferentiated. The sole correlation to this organism points us toward future lives. Readers aside, soul is S-O-U-L, and it reads aside. It is also very important indeed to consider the trunk organization, which is an interplay of powers at work in the human spirit, both before birth and conception and after death, that is, between death and a subsequent birth. In other words, What encompassed the soul during the period between our last death and birth or conception works together in us with what will encompass and surround it between our next death and subsequent birth or conception. These two aspects interweave, acting within the human trunk and becoming especially apparent in the most salient aspect of the trunk organism, the breathing process. The out-breath is primarily an image, and here again I'm using the term image, of what the soul experienced from its previous death through to its latest conception, while the in-breath is a picture of the powers around and within the soul between our next death and the following conception or birth. These are tangible distinctions. What ordinary anatomy and physiology lump together as aspects of the human form, with head, trunk, and limbs all similarly composed of nerves and blood vessels, is distinguished carefully by supersensible insight. Ordinary anatomy and physiology believes it is dealing with immediate realities, whereas our science of the spirit regards the shape of the head as an image of the deeds and feelings of a past incarnation. It sees the out-breath, which is slightly different in quality in each person, since the breathing process, like the head, is individual in nature, as an image of the powers that enfolded the soul from our last death through to our latest birth, and the in-breath as an image 
of powers that will enfold the soul between our coming death and the following birth. In the process at work in our extremities, we already have an image of our next life on earth. Thus, in the same way that our waking life is interwoven with images when we dream, the magnificently expanded supersensible life to which clairvoyant consciousness gains access is pervaded with images too. But these pictures are the reality, in quotes, given to us in ordinary waking life. Every subsequent set of phenomena, starting from clairvoyant consciousness, can be seen as pictures at the next or lower level. Our prosaic reality is a picture of supersensible reality, and our dream reality is a picture of the ordinary reality we encompass in daily life. What I say here really becomes properly clear only to clairvoyant consciousness, simply because the outward human form alone does not reveal all that I, am not, I have now described. If we assume that someone has a lower degree of clairvoyance, of the kind that gives inklings or intimations rather than fully aware perceptions, he would still be able to arrive at an understanding of the head, trunk, and limbs as I have described them. This would not be difficult even for lower clairvoyance. But there would be no certainty in these perceptions. They could not really become conviction without critically testing them by employing a clairvoyance that encompasses states of awareness that accord with aspects of the human form as I have described them. You see, our head points back to former lives, not only in its outward form. Its quality of soul distinguishes it, firstly, from the other parts of our nature, but it is also remarkably inwardly differentiated too though in a way hidden from ordinary awareness. Either this awareness is dreaming, or, when engrossed in the content of daily life, it fails to notice something underlying the head's activity, if I can put it like that. What I mean is this. In waking consciousness we undergo our daily experiences, filling ourselves with the awareness mediated for us by the head by virtue of external sensory perceptions, the pictures conveyed to us by our senses and our thoughts and ideas about these sensory pictures. All this is so vivid and intense for our ordinary waking consciousness that we overlook a subtler awareness which continually trickles beneath it. This is a background awareness that is not as loud or insistent as waking consciousness. Our head actually dreams continually while we are awake. This is important. Our head is engrossed in a continual dream behind our waking consciousness. You can access this dreaming by practicing some exercises of fairly easy scope. You need only try to enter into that state of inner life in which our consciousness or mind is empty, alert and attentive but without sensory perceptions or thoughts. In ordinary life we are either oriented to our world of external perceptions or have memory pictures of these perceptions or thoughts which surface and are also connected with our memories. More often than we think, though, we give ourselves up to merely attentive consciousness without noticing this. It is a dull state. But if you try to create a state in you that I will call, quote, mere waking attention, close quote, with nothing originating in external perceptions, memories, or memory-connected thoughts, trying instead just to be awake and alert, perceptions not so fully dressed in ideas will soon surface in you. These thoughts that surface have a kind of dulled quality of feeling. One can say that they behave like pictures, but without the full weight of pictures. One often encounters people in this state. They can tell you that they have a state of mind which they can perceive but cannot describe. They perceive it, but not in the same way as one perceives outward impressions of the world. Such people are speaking the truth, and there are far more than you think 
who can tell you such things once you know them well. What surfaces here is the weaving of this underlying consciousness I described, which is a kind of dreaming. But what is being dreamed? The dream is of one's previous incarnation, one's former life on earth. But interpreting this is difficult, and yet this is so. What resides in one's awareness in head consciousness is a dream of a former life on earth. In this subjective manner it is possible to access the dream of our past life even though it is difficult to interpret this. We will come back to this again later. A discussion of the human head is therefore complex, also in terms of soul quality, since two consciousnesses are interwoven there, our ordinary waking consciousness and the lower-lying dream consciousness, which is a kind of reflection of our previous incarnation. If we now consider the other pole of the human being, that of our extremities or limbs, we find another interesting soul characteristic. This system of limbs in us is also complex in soul terms, or in other words, in the soul qualities corresponding to it. I have often pointed out that we are asleep in relation to our limb system, whereas we are awake in relation to our head. Our will really does appear to sleep, and we have only the pictures and ideas of what our will accomplishes. When we have the picture of moving our hand, we, nevertheless, are unaware of the connections between this movement and our physical organism. This happens as unconsciously as the processes of sleep. Sleep continually pervades waking awareness of our limbs, this system of extremities in us, and this is because our human will is immersed in a sleeping condition. But here is a remarkable thing. At night, during sleep, when we are outside our physical body, in other words, when the capital I and the astral body have departed from the physical body and etheric body so that consciousness or self-awareness do not function, or only in a dulled state, this system of extremities in us wakes up in a sense. But in our current state of evolution, we cannot fathom this with our ordinary consciousness. Because we can activate our consciousness only to a very dull degree when asleep, we cannot observe what our limb system, which sleeps by day, really accomplishes at night, while self-awareness is not located within the physical body. This too is a kind of dreaming. This limb system in us dreams, one can say, during the night. Just as the head dreams by day, at the same time as it possesses clear waking consciousness, so our limb system dreams below the level of dulled sleep consciousness, or one can say parallel to it or alongside it. And what does it dream? It dreams of its next earthly incarnation. Our outward human form, you see, not only bears past and future within us, but we also bear a past life on earth and a future life on earth in us, in our soul life, in the form of ordinarily imperceptible dreams and in all kinds of underlying consciousness. And now the trunk or thorax. The processes of breathing out and in are not clearly followed by our ordinary awareness, but our organic functions are more closely connected with them. These processes of out-breath and in-breath are raised to conscious awareness in oriental practices, something not appropriate for us. We should enter into clairvoyant consciousness in a different way. The spiritual seeker of the Orient tries to dull his head awareness, to suppress it, and instead to stimulate and illumine consciousness in the thorax. He really does try to make consciousness surface in the breathing process, in the breath. This is a different state of awareness. By becoming aware of how the breath breathed in streams through the organism, and the breath 
breathed out streams forth and leaves the body, he raises into conscious awareness what otherwise remains very unconscious. This induces in him a state in which he has a very clear awareness of something of which the breathing process is an image of life in the world of spirit between death and rebirth. For many people in the Orient it is no theory but a certainty and this is partly why people of East and West fail to understand each other that a soul spiritual life precedes birth and follows death. This is as certain for them as you are certain that after walking for a while you can stop and look back and see the distance you have traveled. Just as you can be quite sure of the path you have traveled and the path you are going to take, so the Oriental perceives what lies before birth or conception and after death and does so in an immediate way through the breathing process raised into consciousness rather than as a theoretical notion based on radiocination. This part of us, the chest, continually dreams in a sense. It does not entirely awaken when we are awake, nor does it entirely sleep when we sleep, although there is a difference between these two states. The dream consciousness of our chest is duller during the day than its dream consciousness at night when we are asleep then it is somewhat brighter. There is not a great difference here, but a slight difference of emphasis. Thus we see that our threefold form is not merely one of outward appearance, but also involves complex differentiation of consciousness, and this is what constitutes our inner life, or life of soul. These states of consciousness interweave with each other, reflecting one another. What we call our life of thinking primarily arises through the daily waking consciousness of our head. The ongoing dream state of our chest system gives rise to what we call our feeling life, and what we call our will emerges by virtue of the dream consciousness of our limb system, which sleeps in the day and wakes at night. One thing still remains. When we consider our external aspect, we are concerned not only with a visible physical organism, but we also bear in us a fine, etheric, supersensible organism, which to avoid misunderstandings I referred to in my recent comments in the journal titled Das Reich as the body of formative forces. Compared to our external physical organism, This supersensible organism is less differentiated, is more of a unified whole, whereas only a superficial view will see our outward form as unified. The real unity of our being resides in our etheric body, and this body should be subdivided in the same way as the physical body, not in terms of distinct and separate parts, but as I have now done in relation to states of consciousness. This etheric body also undergoes continually alternating states of consciousness. In daily life, from the time we wake up to when we fall asleep, it has a different awareness than it does when we sleep. We bear something very important in us with this supersensible body. It is illusory of some theoretical theosophists simply to divide the human being into physical body, etheric body, astral body, and so forth, and to think that this means very much. This merely produces a kind of classification system, and such systems are never very useful. We only gain useful insights if we examine more closely what is actually happening in our etheric body. Just to say we possess an etheric body is to utter a phrase without much significance, a vague picture of some kind of thin fog, and this is illusory. In fact, we have in this etheric body something of key importance, although we cannot usually perceive it. During waking life, the karma of our former lives on earth continually weaves and lives in our etheric body and is perceived by us. This ether body is at work in our subconscious, and its activity is the perception or vision of our karma from past incarnations. The clairvoyant can gain knowledge of karma by learning to use his etheric body 
as we otherwise use our physical body. If we learn to use it, we cannot avoid seeing karma as a reality. You see, from the time we wake up in the morning until we fall asleep at night, the ether body, if we grasp its reality, is constituted of a vision of our karma. During our waking life, it sees our karma from past lives, and during sleep, it perceives our developing karma. I am again describing this as clairvoyance sees it. Thus we dream in our chest not only of what we underwent in the world of spirit between our previous death and latest birth. We not only look upon our past, but also upon the karma it involves for us, the past karma which is perceived below the level of ordinary consciousness as if by an I, E-Y-E, of spirit, by the ether body through the function of the lower body. And we gaze upon all that is connected with a future incarnation, with our developing karma, not only via the consciousness of our extremities through the in-breath, but our ether body becomes the E-Y-E eye of spirit to perceive this future karma in a way that is unconscious for ordinary awareness. It is not easy for people today to develop an inner practice to this degree, although it is certainly necessary for every person to actually perceive what I have now described. This presents certain difficulties, as I have described in more detail in my book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. This was a far easier undertaking in past eras of humanity. You see, history is also more differentiated than people imagine, and the transition between the third to the fourth post-Atlantean era marked an especially important moment in history, which I have also characterized in titled Occult Science and other texts. This was the moment when the Greco-Roman age began, the culture of Greece and Rome, when it became so difficult for humanity to penetrate these worlds any more, to have the perceptions I have described. Before this time it was easier, relatively speaking, and Orientals have retained something of this capacity. People in the Occident no longer possess it and are therefore unable to engage in the kinds of exercise practiced in the Orient. Instead, they must turn to those described, for instance, in knowledge of the higher worlds. The era commencing around the 7th and 8th centuries BC was certainly one when humankind was cast further out into the physical world. Another age will come, beginning fully around the third millennium, and we must prepare for this. Something undefined will rise up into every soul from our human nature at this point, and people will be unable to interpret this without the resources of esoteric science, of spiritual science. What spiritual science must prepare and found for the future millennium is really not subjective in nature, not, not some kind of wishful thinking, but corresponds to a necessity of human evolution. The middle of the third millennium will bring a significant and incisive development. It will be the time when human nature has developed to the point where it will react in an unhealthy way if by then people have not assimilated insight into repeated lives on earth and human karma, which was lost back in the 7th and 8th centuries B.C. Previously, human nature responded healthily, and knowledge of these things arose naturally from it. In future, this same human nature will appear pathological if people themselves do not endow it with these teachings. We can only properly understand the age we live in if we see that in this sense we are enclosed between two poles, one of which lies before the 7th and 8th centuries B.C., before the mystery of Golgotha, when human nature itself gave us knowledge of the soul's supersensible experiences. The other pole will come in the third millennium, when by its own powers, as described in Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, the human soul must acquire supersensible knowledge by spiritual means, so that the body does not succumb to illness, but is infused with healthy powers. 
Only by grasping this can we understand both outer and inner phenomena in our age. These things are of course only developing slowly and gradually. It is important if we do not want to sleep through these developments, sleepwalk through them, to notice what is trying to find its way into life, which will only fully unfold by the middle of the third millennium. Gradually it seeks entry, and humanity must start to do everything consciously, consciously preparing the way for what is coming. We have to learn to observe life, and then even outward phenomena, the surface of things, initially in relationship to human life, can show us that what I have said is true. In ordinary coarser brain development, the necessary insights described in spiritual science do not easily dawn. In a tragic way we can discern what unknown powers, which I will speak about in the next lecture, really want of humanity. At the present time there are certain pathological and therefore tragic natures in whom nevertheless certain things become apparent already that will emerge in healthy people in the future. I have often mentioned the name of a very curious man whose life swung back and forth between health and sickness, Otto Weininger, who wrote the strange book titled Gender and Character. Weininger himself is an extremely curious figure. First you have his dissertation, the first chapter of his book, which some praised to the skies, while others condemned it. Neither of these was an appropriate objective response, really. Then Weininger increasingly becomes preoccupied with the problems he himself raised in gender and character. He makes a trip to Italy, records his experiences there and sees quite different things on this journey than others see there. In this Italian journal by Weininger, I find some very curious things. As you know, I describe many things that can only be perceived through imaginations, from the Atlantean era, from Lemurian times, and how things appeared in times that we cannot easily grasp by contemporary modes of awareness nor through historical records. Here one has to employ certain ideas and concepts, clothe things in a way that the contemporary mind can grasp. When I read Weininger's journal, much of it strikes me as a successful artistic caricature of the truth. Weininger's life in general was rather strange and remarkable. At the age of 23, a thought takes hold of him, hypnotizes him, that he must kill himself because otherwise he will have to murder someone else, that a criminal is lurking in his soul. It is easy to explain this in esoteric terms. Grandeur and exact perception merge in him with a superficial willfulness. He leaves his parents' home and takes a room in the Berhoven house in Vienna, stays there one night and in the morning shoots himself. The distinctive quality of this soul was that it never wholly connected with the body. An ordinary psychiatric diagnosis would call Weininger an hysteric. Anyone who can see deeper will discern that there was an irregular connection between his soul spirit and his physical body. Unlike others, in whom soul and spirit depart from the body during sleep and reconnect with it on awakening, Weininger's spirit soul rises out of his body from time to time. I can point you to the passages where this is apparent. Then, quickly, submerges in it again. And as it does so, a thought lights up, which he then records in writing, often in a very dry way. As his soul and spirit immerse themselves in the body, again he becomes imaginative in a very curious way. We can see an irregular connection of the soul and spirit with the body here, which in a very distinctive and curious way gives rise to a form of knowledge that humanity will have to have in the future. Just imagine this. In someone whom mainstream psychiatrists would call it an hysteric, appears knowledge that humanity will need in future, albeit in caricature form. You can therefore easily see that the precursors of the future, just as there are throwbacks to past eras, can appear amongst us in various forms regarded as abnormal 
by present standards, precursors of a time when people will need to know about successive lives on earth, about karma, and about how karma is dreamed in us. It is because such people appear as the precursors of future eras that their knowledge renders their organism pathological rather than healing it. By the end of their pathology, something emerges as a caricature of human, humanity's future knowledge. For instance, take the following passage from Beininger's book titled On Last Things, published by his friend Rappaport. Quote, Perhaps it is not possible to recall anything of our condition before birth, since we are sunk so deep through birth. We have lost an awareness and have demanded to be born in a quite impulsive way, without rational decision or knowledge, and therefore we know nothing about this past existence. Close quote. One thing is clear. Even though the insight that has lit up here is a caricature, yet there is absolute certainty of it that this person emerged at birth from a spiritual state where he existed previously. If anyone had written this in the 10th or 12th century B.C. or even at the time of origin, there would have been no reason to wonder at it. But when someone writes this in our day, in his own distinctively emotive way, it is not theoretical, but something of immediate reality in his awareness. I could cite many more such examples. What do they show us? Nothing other than the prefiguring, the announcing of this supersensible knowledge that seeks entry into human nature. And because it is not sufficiently sought by means of anthroposophical spiritual science, it enters in cataclysmic ways, convulsing human nature, making it pathological, as it did in Weininger. If I use this word, I do not do so in a disparaging way. I am simply describing the facts, the reality of illness in someone who shoots himself at the age of 23 because he discovers a concealed murderer within him and wishes to kill himself, to save himself from becoming a murderer. There are hundreds, thousands more such instances. This knowledge is seeking entry, and it would be good if a great many people, as many as possible, would see that this is so. The longing for such knowledge is very widespread in the human subconscious. Outward powers, I have often characterized, are holding this knowledge back. At the end of my essay on Christian Rosenkreutz, published in the journal Das Reich, I mentioned that we should pay careful attention to what has been emerging since the 17th century, or actually already since the 15th, announcing itself and becoming increasingly clamorous. The time has come to speak to our contemporaries of this in forms of ordinary academic discourse. Back then it emerged as I described in the last issue of Das Reich where I spoke of how Johann Valentin Andrea wrote down titled The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Philologists have been tearing their hair out over this. Johann Valentin Andrea writes down The Chemical Wedding which in fact conceals profound esoteric knowledge. And after this he behaves in what is really a very curious way. Not only does he engage in elaborate but vain attempts to define certain words relating to texts written by him at the same time as the chemical wedding, but also despite having written down the latter text himself, he appears to have no clue to the meaning of what he wrote. The pious pastor, who subsequently wrote all kinds of other things, understands nothing about the chemical wedding, nor about other texts he wrote at the same time. He was only seventeen when he wrote the chemical wedding. He is not changed. He remains the same person. But a quite different power inspired him at the time. The philologists tear their hair out and compare the handwriting of many different passages in his letters. His hand certainly wrote the text. His body sat there as he did so. But a spiritual power announced itself through his person, a power that was not incarnated on earth at the time, but wished to proclaim these things to humanity. Then came the Thirty Years' War, burying much of what should have entered humanity at the time. 
During this period, things that should have been understood were not, were buried instead. The chemical wedding was written down by the hand of Johann Valentin Andrea. It has been accurately dated to 1603. But it elicited little response since the Thirty Years' War started in 1618. Such things sometimes occur before wars begin. But if we read the signs of the times, we can discern that what is planted as seed in this way must also bear blossoms and fruit. This is part and parcel of what I have been intimating, what must be read from the signs of our own very catastrophic times. And I will speak more of this next week.